And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe. I'm Doug Keck, where no man has gone before. On a weekly basis, we try it out, though, and we're happy you join us in this journey coming to you from our EW10 studios in Irondale, Alabama, the mothership where it all began with Mother Angelica back in 19. 81. Always a reminder to send us an email, check us out on Facebook, send us a tweet on Twitter. That's how we get those questions we use in the first half of the show. So if you want to hear Father Spitzer answering your specific question, that's the way to get it to us. Or you can go to the Magis Center's website, magiscenter.com, for all things that relate to Father Spitzer and his wonderful work. Today's topic, 10 universal principles and six categories of social discourse. We had four levels of happiness, which we're actually going to finish off at six social discourse categories. There are a lot of numbers coming at you this week. And there's also another number, a new number, which is the latest uh, of our EWTN books coming out. That's right, by our good friend from the North, Father John Horgan. And it's his angels at our side, understanding their power in our souls and the world. Coming to you fresh off the press, EW10 Publishing, the latest one that's out. Mother Angelica, love the angels. Father John Horgan's been on the show many times talking about the angels. It's a great book for all those people out there. And check it out on our EW10 website, of course. RC.com is our EW10 website. EW10RC.com for that book. And as well as also Father Spitzer's book, as you can see, 10 Universal Principles, A Brief Philosophy of the Life Issues. With that said, let's waste no more time. Turn once more to the West Coast and the beautiful campus out there at Christ Cathedral in Orange County, California. Coming into view is Father Spitzer. How are you, Father? Good to have you with us again. I'm doing great. Great to have uh, be with you, uh, Doug, and uh, uh, it is really beautiful out here. <laughs> it always is, apparently so. But let's get started with a prayer so we can get into some questions and move ahead. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, please bless us with your Holy Spirit this day to inspire, guide, and protect us so that uh, all that we do and say may edify your people. Bless our audience and help them to hear your word through this program and to come to the nuance and to the consolation they need in the pursuit of their faith. We ask all of these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Very good. So obviously we're going to be uh, hitting the end of the four levels of happiness. There's a couple of things in there before we get into the social discourse aspect of the book. Then we're almost mm -hmm. getting to the very end of the book. So we'll have a, mm -hmm. a very interesting announcement at the end of this program talking about something coming up. Uh, not right away, but in a, another month or so, maybe, maybe sooner than that, and we'll talk about that. Yeah. So hang around, a cliffhanger with Father for later <laughs> in the show. You have to stay here. You can't leave this part of the universe uh, quite yet. So let's get to a question. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, can you explain the existence of ghosts? Do they exist mm -hmm. because the person died and refused to enter into judgment after death? Are they souls going through purgatory? Thank you. This is uh, Augustine from New York City. So I guess the question, are there ghosts? And if so, what are they manifestations of? Yes, Augustine, there are ghosts, mm -hmm. and um, there are ghosts of human beings, and um, some of those ghosts of, of human beings are uh, seem to be people that um, are, are kind of s uh, stuck in a state of abeyance right here on this earth, and I don't know how that's necessarily possible, mm -hmm. um, but uh, they seem to be so. Uh, I, I also know that uh, there are ghosts that, that seem to, uh, you know, certainly uh, of human beings that, that may appear um, uh, from a uh, less than desirable domain. And uh, that could be from the mm -hmm. domain of both um, uh, uh, hell and also from the domain of uh, uh, I would suspect heaven as well, and um, you know, but they wouldn't be a ghost necessarily. They would be a saintly apparition. But uh, the the point uh, is, yes, there certainly are 
uh, those uh, those ghosts there. Uh, Peter Kreeft uh, has mm -hmm. written uh, an article on this, and you might uh, take a look at that. It's mm -hmm. free online. You just Google Peter Kreeft and uh, Kreeft and put in uh, mm -hmm. ghosts, and you'll get uh, his assessment of uh, you know uh, spirits from heaven mm -hmm. and from hell and from uh, uh, purgatory, and so he's got a a real sense there. I I do think there is also some kind of uh, Mm -hmm. Almost, uh, you know, an abeyance. You know, somebody has died, and and uh, they seem to be, you know, staying mm -hmm. uh, right here um, on this earth and and choosing not to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in some state of abeyance, and it, it's curious. But uh, there seems mm -hmm. to be a, a terrific amount of evidence for it, and mm -hmm. so uh, uh, I just um, um, would say yes. Uh, the answer is yes. They're here. Right. And uh, by the way, there's biblical warrant for that in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Now, what about the idea of us communicating with them or not? What does the church say about something like that? Well, we, you should never communicate with. Now, obviously, if it's, if it's, uh, you know, the ghost of uh, your parent mm -hmm. and they're coming down or something to to console you mm -hmm. uh, for some reason or another, um, you know, of course you can communicate mm -hmm. with your parent or or something of that nature. But generally, those kinds of apparitions, whether they be heavenly apparitions or perhaps they're apparitions of of uh, a, a ghost, maybe who might be in purgatory we don't know, mm -hmm. but who is given the privilege of coming uh, back to, to console you or to console somebody, uh, that probably uh, the, the church would view as, as fine. Mm -hmm. But to try and go to a seance or right. something, mm -hmm. you know, and try and communicate with a spirit that has not uh, come to you as your parent or something of that nature, absolutely crazy to do that. Right. Because number one in a seance, you don't know who you're conjuring up. Mm -hmm. The only thing you know is who that particular spirit says he or she is. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean anything at all. Because, of course, that could be a very evil spirit, mm -hmm. not even a ghostly human spirit. It could be an evil demonic spirit. And, of course, what we're mm -hmm. talking about there is is uh, easily, uh, you know, could, could, you know, turn your life into pure misery mm -hmm. with obsession, oppression, and sometimes even possession. Uh, I'm reminded of Robbie Mannheim, mm -hmm. uh, that this was the true exorcism behind that book, The Exorcist, that right. took place in St. Louis. But he got started because his, wife, his uh, aunt had told him, uh, you know, how to use a Ouija board right. and uh, to conjure up, you know, spirits of the dead. And when she died quite suddenly, he was lonely. And so he tried to conjure her up. Mm -hmm. But the spirit who said that he was her was not her. And of course, that mm -hmm. led to his possession. So whatever you do, Mm -hmm. Never try to communicate, uh, you know, with a spirit by a seance, by Ouija board, anything else at all. It would be a absolute craziness. You take your whole spiritual life into your hands. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if some, you know, if, a, if an apparition of your mother or father comes to you or something of that nature, of course, you can say, Mom and Dad, I hope you're fine. And, you know, thank you for what you have given me, et cetera. And of right. course, if you, you see an apparition of, of Jesus or something of that nature, that's not a ghostly uh, being. Uh, that, of course, is Jesus, mm -hmm. who is, uh, you know, a divine being. Divine. So, um, again, you want to be very, very careful about such apparitions, and you want to test them according to the criteria that the church has set out uh, in order to know, right. as St. Paul tells us again and again, test the spirits. Know, uh, you know, that it's right. really uh, Jesus the Holy Spirit uh, that's moving you or is present to is you. Is that why we, we hear what the term necromancy then? Was that with that whole idea of, of speaking or contacting uh, yeah, the dead? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's uh, right. I mean, that was a, that's pretty much a, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a term that we don't very much use today, mm. uh, but it refers to the very same thing, right. trying to conjure up the dead, right. necro, you know, being dead and, you know. Well, let me ask you um, a question um, then. You, you kind of yeah. mm -hmm. talked about some, let's say, from purgatory, let's say somehow someone came from heaven and visited you or from purgatory, would they be 
a spirit then as opposed to a ghost? Is there a differentiation in your mind? Oh, well, I, I mean, uh, basically, the, it's the same. It's two English words used for the same thing, for, right? Uh, right. For the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Numa. So, just in the the gospel reading according to Luke that we read last mm -hmm. week, you know, they thought they were seeing a penuma. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that you know, we would translate it today as spirit, but previously, right. the more common translation was ghost. Right, uh, which is thing. why, you know, sometimes people will say Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit in, in one of the prayers. That's right, same Basically, thing. Basically, mm -hmm. just, just a usage issue. Okay, very good. Coming up next, mm -hmm. this person wrote to us and they said, and I know they didn't see this on EW10, it certainly wasn't Father Mitch's show, I recently watched a Bible study where two women said many things in the Bible were not true. They said Moses did not get the commandments and that there was no parting of the sea <laughs> and that Job didn't exist. I'm having trouble believing this. Is there something I can read on the subject? And this is Jean from Illinois. Well, she, she's got great discernment to not believe that, but yeah. what's your take from yeah. Okay, Jean, just uh, two quick things. Uh, the, the first thing is, with respect to Moses getting the commandments, he did. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's just a, uh, you know, uh, a part of, um, you know, uh, uh, scriptural writ. And anybody who says the contrary certainly couldn't possibly prove that thesis. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, that's ridiculous. And, and remember the old saying, arbitrarily asserted, arbitrarily denied. Mm -hmm. For all intents and purposes, we have scriptural writ which says he did get the commandments and there's absolutely no evidence to the contrary. Uh, so that's an arbitrary assertion. You can turn right around and say to that nice woman, I arbitrarily deny it. You have absolutely no grounds or evidence for making that statement contrary to scriptural writ. Mm -hmm. uh, the second uh, thing about the, you know, Moses didn't part the Red Sea. There are many interpretations of what the parting of the Red Sea was. Is this referring to the Reed Sea? Is it the real Red Sea? Is it a, you know, a channel that was through the Red Sea? And there have been several of these channels identified mm. you know, where, where you know, the, the Israelites could have crossed at a very, very shallow point, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, it's hard to say what the meaning uh, of that is. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, you know, the idea that you know, the, uh, the Cecil B. DeMille version mm. of how this took place is pretty clear. You know, the, the waves are kind of right, roaring right. on either side of Moses. Did that actually happen? Uh, I'm not so sure about right. that. Mm -hmm. But of course, did Moses go uh, through something akin to the Red Sea or the, mm -hmm. or the Reed Sea? And, and, and did uh, this stop the, the Egyptians who were pursuing them? I believe that's a part of mm -hmm. scriptural writ for which we have no real reason to deny it. Mm -hmm. Now, the existence of Job is a different thing. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what you're talking about, you know, in Exodus, uh, for example, which is the book where we would read about Moses, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when we're talking about that, we're definitely talking about what we'll call a historical book. Mm -hmm. So it's a book that has the law in it. We call it Torah, but it's also a historical book. And Job is a story. So um, that, that's not a book where, you know, Job is, is like a real character. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about a, a real character. This is a literary story, and the reason for the composition of that story mm -hmm. is principally because um, the, this Old Testament a series of authors, they want to explain suffering. Okay. Why does God allow suffering? Particularly because in the book of Exodus, right, and in the book of Deuteronomy Leviticus, we see these statements that God rewards the just. God rewards those who follow the law. So, of course, they, they're, the Israelites are seeing people that are um, suffering who were law-abiding people. Mm -hmm. And so this question is arising, well, wait a minute, how can this happen? Because Job, you know, and, and, and of course, Job is, is, is the character in this story. It's written as a story. The Israelite people know it's a story. It's not a literal character of a person, who, I mean, not a character of a person who really existed uh, in history. Mm -hmm. And of, they're, they're trying to figure out, okay, why would this have happened to Job? Mm -hmm. And so there are at least three authors of the book 
book of Job, uh, and two major strands. There's an early strand of Job and a later strand of Job. Everything from the Elihu uh, discourses onward is a later strand of Job. But it is a story, and so the two women in that case are correct. Uh, Job was not a historical figure. Mm -hmm. He's a literary figure. The Israelites knew it, and of course, St. Jerome knew it. And of course, if you go to a book, and in the future, when you have these kinds of historical questions, uh, which are very good, just go to a book called the Jerome Biblical Commentary. Mm -hmm. The Jerome Biblical Commentary, which is the Catholic, uh, official Catholic commentary on scripture that comes from uh, the Catholic pontifical uh, biblical um, source uh, you know uh, a commission so you know you can actually turn to that you go to the introduction mm -hmm. of a particular book and it tells you right there is this a historical book is this a literary book is this a book of prayers like the Psalms etc so it mm -hmm. tells you what kind of a book it is and then of course it explains uh, you know the historical genre. Now the way ancient people did history is a little bit different mm -hmm. uh, from the way we do history today. Uh, they do put theological content and interpretation into uh, history. So you, you kind of have to know how that works. But the Jerome Biblical Commentary should be a very good start for you uh, to figure out how that works. Uh, you know also um, you know, Dr. Scott Hahn has done some very good things about the historicity of Scripture, too. So there's some really good books that you can mm -hmm. turn to. But the Jerome Biblical Commentary normally gives you a fairly good assessment of the historicity uh, or the historical character of mm -hmm. the literary genre or the, the literary character um, and, and genre of a particular book of Scripture. Okay. Do you think sometimes the problem with something like this and, and understanding this, as you just pointed out, is somebody says, mm -hmm. well, if Job's not real, then oh, what's the rest of the stories all about? How do we know which ones are and which ones aren't? I mean, you kind of explained an understanding uh -oh. of it, but you can understand yeah. why people get yeah. confused, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's really important to know uh, a science called hermeneutics. You know, this is the science of interpretation, right? So, and, and, and uh, there is a, a whole section on hermeneutics at the beginning of the Jerome Biblical Commentary. And it, it tells you the methodology used to decide whether something's a historical book. Like, like the f very first uh, 12 books of the Old Testament mm -hmm. are predominantly historical. Right, so you go all the way through First and Second Chronicles. So now Genesis has some literary uh, elements in there mm -hmm. and some you know mythological elements in there at the beginning, but then Genesis starts taking off on a historical trajectory, and that trajectory is carried through Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, right, and just keeps going, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the way through till you get to you know First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and then of course. Uh, at that point we begin to break off and then go into the Psalms mm -hmm. so you know uh, again you know just for a quick thought the, the Old Testament can be divided into three kinds of books there are historical books like the ones I just described there are prophetic books mm -hmm. so these would be the oracles of the prophets and they're set within a historical context, and their writings and oracles and uh, of the prophets of what's to be or what has happened, mm -hmm. and, and the fulfillment of an oracle. And so you might think of like the books of Daniel mm -hmm. and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and um, you know Isaiah and so forth. So there are many books of the prophets. Those are major prophets I just listed. There are also minor prophets as well. And then there's what are called Psalms, right, and, and, and wisdom literature. Now, sometimes Psalms are grouped with wisdom literature, mm -hmm. but sometimes uh, the Psalms are viewed as a separate set of books. And wisdom literature then would begin with Proverbs, mm -hmm. something of that nature. But it uh, includes, of course, um, uh, uh, Sirach and wisdom okay. and um, uh, the, the book of Ecclesiastes and so forth. So that those would be wisdom books. And wisdom books are a different literary 
literary genre, right? They really tell you not so much about prophecies, not so much about history, but these are, uh, you know, um, uh, trying to tell you uh, through a proverbial wisdom kind of an approach. Mm -hmm. They're trying to tell you, uh, you know, how to live your life, what makes sense, mm -hmm. what does God desire, uh, and and it's just right. done in a, in a in a very different uh, literary frame. Okay, very good. Uh, next up, we've got another question on a totally different topic, but kind of related to one of our past shows. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, if life itself is an inalienable right, then why won't our priests speak out about it more often in their homilies? It's very rare that I hear a priest bring up the subject of abortion. Is it because they do not feel qualified to speak on the subject? I love your show. God bless you. This is Jim. Well, Jim, I um, um, I suppose what I could say uh, from the, the start is is this, um, that um, some priests, I think, feel a sense of fear, uh, a cultural pressure not to bring up a controversial issue. And I know some priests feel that way, but other priests honestly don't. Uh, other priests will bring it up uh, right there from the pulpit. Uh, I think, again, some priests are, are uh, uh, reticent to bring up maybe sometimes political issues and things because they do, they feel like okay I'm not qualified to be speaking about a socio-political issue mm -hmm. uh, and and I think that's one of the reasons that that may well occur I think thirdly you know you have uh, uh, some priests that um, that um, you know in their own um, view might might lean a little bit towards uh, social justice and think, for example, uh, you know that um, uh, you know preaching about pro-life issues is not within their scope. They'd rather speak about social justice issues. But it's all one major issue, which is the issue of justice. Mm -hmm. And abortion is the gravest injustice that there is. So I'm not sure why they feel that way, but I know there are some priests who do feel that way. So you've got a whole variety of people. Uh, you know, it goes literally from fear to uh, lack of qualification to I'd rather speak about these social justice issues right. rather than those other social justice issues. So people have what, I, what they call their preferred social justice issues. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's all of the above, right. really. And I would think there's also the case, uh, sometimes I think priests feel at times that, you know, as much as they're challenging people, they don't want to hurt somebody who's gone through this already and maybe feels like they're being yep. called out at mass. And I'm not saying that that's a reason that they shouldn't do it. I think we all, many of us, uh, mm -hmm. uh, applaud the times that we do hear strong and powerful preaching as we do here on EWTN uh, on pro-life mm -hmm. issues. But uh, that may be another thing mm -hmm. where, you know, the kind of overly pastoral concern uh, might lead one not to say something that if it was said, though it may impact somebody negatively, there may be several others out there haven't gone down that path yet and need to hear it. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, it's the old false sense of compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously Jesus thought compassion was the height of virtue. And, and of course, the, the whole parable of the Good Samaritan uh, is about that kind of compassion and sensitivity uh, to people, uh, you know, who've really gone through uh, terrible, terrible situations mm -hmm. uh, with abortion and other things. But on the other hand, there is a need, you know, in, in all due respect, Mm -hmm. True compassion is not just feeling compassion for somebody who's been through something, but it's feeling compassion for the person who's about to go through this. And unless somebody says something, mm -hmm. right, you know, uh, you know to, to reverse track, to help them not to get into this situation, what will wind up happening is you let the, the sheep go astray. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is a real problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you know, again, sometimes you have to say, well, I have to do a calculus of compassion. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel compassion toward the, the victim who's already been through it, but I ought to feel compassion for the person who's about to get into it. And, and so I, I better right. speak up and try and teach this thing properly so that we don't create not only more victims who are going to live and be in church, but all those other victims who are going to die prematurely because of that action. Right. And, you know, just even when I was a, a young high school kid, I, I just had a friend who, who really, you know, uh, who we were sitting on a boat together in Hawaii, and uh, you know, and he just said, you know, I, 
my, my girlfriend has gotten pregnant. I think I'm going to get an abortion. I said, no. Mm -hmm. I just told him, don't, 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 don't do it. And we went at it all night long, and he didn't. And when I saw that little baby, mm -hmm. and then I saw that baby grow up, mm -hmm. I can tell you this right now. Uh, I mean, thank God mm -hmm. I said something. Right. I, I just can't even imagine my not saying something now. I mean, in, in retrospect. So, right. you, know, um, you, you know, what's compassion? Right. You have to be wise about what's compassion. You can't just go for the visceral stuff. You gotta think through what do people need to hear to stay out of trouble? And that is really, really important. So my thought would be, uh, I hope more priests speak strongly about this because boy, the victims, when you don't speak strongly about this, when you act like there's nothing wrong, you not only victimize right. the unborn, you victimize the person who aborts the unborn. And that, that should be countered in church. Right but also in every avenue that we can outside of church. Right, and I think uh, on a larger expansion issue of it, the people who are out there who might be facing in their own life with their own family, their own children or grandchildren, these issues need to hear it spoken oh, yeah. from the pulpit to reinforce the fact that they understand this is such an important issue so that when they're faced with it, yeah. they're not going saying, well, I'm going to be pastoral about this and kind of say, well, if, yeah. if Father doesn't think it's such a big deal, then maybe I'm overreacting, whatever kind of issue it might be that is, uh, you know, happening inside a family. I, I, to I totally agree. And not only that, I think abortion can justifiably be pointed to as one of the big guilty culprits for the decline in, in birth rate, the decline in family life, you know, and a variety of other things. And you say, oh, no, you're using abortion, you know, that's the club for everything that's going wrong in society. Well, it's not everything, mm -hmm. but it sure is at the root of a lot of decline mm -hmm. in desirable things like strong families, strong cultures, strong sense of morality within mm -hmm. culture. I mean, you know, as I've said countless times, what becomes legal becomes normative. Mm -hmm. What becomes normative becomes moral. If you start saying it's okay, it's legal to have an abortion, which I, I obviously do not believe in, mm -hmm. what happens is people start doing it mm -hmm. because it's legalized. And then people start thinking, well, it has to be moral because everybody, quote unquote everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's not doing it. But quote unquote everybody's doing it mm -hmm. so therefore it has to be moral or there's so many people doing it it can't be immoral mm -hmm. and the moment we start doing that the whole of culture gets weakened the whole sense of the wonder dignity beauty and mystery of children is completely undercut which of course undercuts the family mm -hmm. I mean you don't have to be a genius to move from you know okay we're gonna kill innocent pre-born children for the mere fact that they're you know, in utero, mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, you, you think that you can do this without undermining the sense of the intrinsic dignity and goodness and mystery and wonder of children who are little eternities destined for eternal life with God in heaven. You're going to undermine the mm -hmm. whole idea of the intrinsic dignity and goodness of children, and that's not going to have an effect on the family. Of course it's going to have an effect on the family, and it's going to lead to the breakdown of the family. In in fact, it's going to lead not only to that, but people are going to think children are not a, you know, that's not a reason to get married. Mm -hmm. A reason to get married is, quote unquote, true love. True love is a great reason to be married. But of course, the fecundity of that true love gets expressed mm -hmm. in those children. Mm -hmm. and, and, and of course, those children, once they're in the family, nobody wants to give them up, right? I mean, even in the midst of divorce, an unfortunate circumstance, right? But in the midst of divorce, what's the one? thing that's at stake all the time the custody of the children right. the two divorce parties the most important thing is the children yeah. so what I'm trying to say is you know of, of course children are the glue mm -hmm. 
uh, of a family. Of course they are the redounding love that goes back not just to the couple individual as individuals, but to the couple collectively in their togetherness and in their union that love is returned to them. And, and, and that's why children are so important to, to, to the solidity of the family. And of course, the idea that a, a strong family is not intrinsic uh, to, to a strong, mm -hmm. good culture that's oriented, uh, you know, toward good moral objectives. Are you kidding me? A strong family, where is morality most deeply, viscerally felt? Mm -hmm. In the families that teach that morality right. to their children and in the families that are going to church and sharing right. that experience of church with their children so that they have that sense not only of God, their destiny, their eternal dignity, but also that morality which will keep them on the road to salvation. This is the foundation stone of culture. It's unthinkable right. that weak families are going to lead to a strong culture or culture will be just as strong even in the midst of all these weak families and the hacking apart of the definition of the family this is just nonsense it, it is uh, you know and I, I'm sorry I'm overreacting uh, no. here but I, I must tell you I feel very strongly that this is nothing more than sophistry at its best and I think it really needs to be uh, well, objectively resisted powerfully with, Powerfully spoken, Good scientific power, studies. powerfully said, and that's why I certainly didn't want to interrupt you while you were making some fabulous points. <laughs> we're going to take a break and be back. Uh, Father Spitzer's got to catch his breath, get a drink of water. Much more <laughs> ahead here on Father Spitzer's Universe, of course. We'll be back talking about the topic in the book right after this quick break. See you then. And thank you so much for staying with us here on Father Spitzer's Universe as we re-engage 10 universal principles, six categories of social discourse is overall what we're talking about, but uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the four levels of happiness. But first, as we turn to Father Spitzer once again, uh, let's get a question that someone, again, uh, maybe reading ahead, projecting out, mm -hmm. has uh, got a question for you about what our topic is today. And they say, okay. relating, relating to your six categories of social discourse, I have an atheist friend mm -hmm. who, along with her mother, have planned that, that when life becomes too difficult that they will each be euthanized. How do I express to an atheist lovingly that their life is worth more when they feel I'm infringing upon their rights? And this is Simone. Well, uh, Simone, I would just uh, say two things. First of all, your own desire and compassion to express that straight out as you have said it is really important from the start. So it's really critical for you to say those exact words to your friends. You know, I view your life as worth something. I view your friendship as worth something. I view your presence and your humor and your love in my life as worth something. I would be devastated if you euthanized yourself because I think that you have not only value to yourself and value, you have value to me and you have value to your other friends. And even though you won't acknowledge it, you have value to God. So, uh, I, I would be devastated. So please, you know, don't speak that way. I, I, I just think the idea of suicide mm -hmm. is intentionally depriving all of us who love you mm -hmm. from having that sense of your lovability and your goodness and your presence in our lives. You, you deprive us right. of it almost as if you're rejecting us. And I'm, I'm begging you, don't do that. Right. You're worth far more than that. Right. And Simone, I think you're right on the marker. I think you really do have a sense of, of what's right. there. You know, if you're going to get deeper than that, then I would suggest really going back to these six principles of cultural discourse that we're going to be talking about a mm -hmm. little m later in this program. Right, exactly. 
And our Lord, that was at St. Paul, you know, speak the truth in love. So, I mean, it's the truth, but it can be presented yep. that way. And that well, I think you need to do that. Otherwise, if something happens later, you'll just be kicking yourself that maybe your word might have changed uh, what ultimately happened one way or the other. So. Yeah, just like my friend on the boat. Right, exactly. Yeah. Now, have you ever mispronounced spectroscopy in a public <laughs> lecture? Maybe yes. I just did. When I, did I mispronounce when, it? <laughs> when I was in the tw uh, uh, senior in a physics presentation, I pronounced the word spectroscopy uh, as spectroscopy. See, that's and, what uh, I mean. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> it was very embarrassing, particularly when one of my friends told me that uh, that uh, I, I seemed like a consummate idiot to the rest of the class. Right. I went home and replayed that tape a hundred times. But I must tell you, um, after I got over the shock and uh, the suicidal feelings, just kidding, you know, uh, I, I basically recovered. So, uh, but it. it uh, that's uh, if you're level two and mm -hmm. you mispronounce the word spectroscopy, get ready. Uh, it, it could be in for some real well, depression. Well, I, I'm going to be working on that one. I'm just a, I'm level one, so I don't, <laughs> I, I don't have to feel too bad about mispronouncing that. But uh, uh, let's move into the six categories of cultural discourse, which is what we wanted to talk about on this mm -hmm. program. You talk about some new quality of life slash success, freedom or choice, mm -hmm. ethics, virtue, love. Suffering social responsibility. You want to tell us what do these categories yeah. mean and why are they important? Yeah, uh, and these are categories that we use, and I call them social discourse because when we talk about culture or we talk about society or we talk about politics, we're always going to make recourse to these six topics. So, you know, uh, quality of life and success, I group them as one category of cultural discourse. And of course, virtue and ethics, that's another category of cultural discourse. Freedom is another, right? So when we're listening to, for example, the dialogue about pro-life or, uh, you know, people who are pro-abortion or something of that nature, when you hear, uh, you know, them use the word freedom or you hear them use the word quality of life or you hear them use the word ethics or virtue or you hear them use the word personhood or you hear them use the word common good, you have to all of a sudden, uh, or the word suffering, you have to say to yourself, just with those four levels of happiness, is this suffering one, two, three, or four? Is this personhood one, two, three, or four? Is this, uh, you know, ethics one, two, three, or four? Is this quality of life success one, two, three, or four? Is this love one, two, three, or four? Mm -hmm. So you got to figure out what in the world, right, you know, um, they're, they're talking about. Now, re let's go through those four levels of happiness for just one second, mm -hmm. and I think I can sort of describe to you why the four levels of happiness apply to all those other terms of, of cultural discourse. Remember, level one, that's materialistic pleasure. So Bob Spitzer sees a bowl of linguine, Wolf sit down, and he's happy. Mm -hmm. Very superficial. Mm -hmm. Let's call that level one happiness, materialistic and pleasure. Number Number two, ego comparative. I'm achieving more, I'm smarter, I've got more status and more power, I'm happy. Mm -hmm. But if I don't have that, or I'm fluctuating in between, or I'm playing this crazy comparison game, mm -hmm. I'm not happy. So for all intents and purposes though, ego comparative happiness is all about who's achieving more, who's achieving less, who's smarter, less smart, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Then we go to the third level of happiness and we're switching off. Now we're going to contributive happiness. That's where I'm trying to make an optimal positive difference to the world around me. I want the world to be better off for my having lived. So I'm trying to make an optimal positive difference to my family, to my friends, to my church, to the kingdom of God, to my community, and if I'm so lucky, mm -hmm. to the society or to the culture as well. And every fiber of my being is not about I'm smarter than you are, mm -hmm. or I've got more power than you do, or I've got more status than you do. That's not what makes my life worth living. That's not what gives me meaning. I could care less. It's, it's what I use my intelligence for, mm -hmm. my status for, my power for. And I'm, if I'm using it for my family, 
my friends, the church, the kingdom of God, my community, the society, and the culture, you're going to have a really meaningful life. Let's call that contributive uh, happiness. Mm -hmm. And finally, of course, you've guessed it, the fourth level of happiness is transcendent happiness. That's where we bring our faith into being. We recognize those words of St. Augustine, for thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Only God alone can satisfy us, right? He's given us a desire for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. Mm -hmm. And of course, God himself alone is perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. So only God can satisfy us. God is present to us in our interior lives from the very day we are conceived. And at that very point, God is already, in, as it were, in, in, in inviting us into the fullness of himself. So we're made for level four as well. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if we put everything in order with the highest, most pervasive, enduring, and deep level of happiness first, and then define everything else in terms of it, mm -hmm. then level three finds its proper place, and level two finds its proper place, and level one, the bowl of linguine, finds its proper place. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm trying to say is, all the various definitions that we just talked about, so let's just start with freedom. You can see that freedom on, on level one is, is, is just you know, getting my highest emotional needs satisfied right now. You can see what freedom is on level two. It's don't bother we, me with any constraints or commitments to anybody or anything. I'm going to be happy when I'm me, when I've got my autonomy in place. Mm -hmm. I'm not constrained by commitments to anybody. I'm not constrained by responsibilities to anyone. I've got all my commitments open. Hardly a notion. I mean, people feel free in level two when, the, when they're level two. Uh, in this way, but mm -hmm. of course it's not real freedom. Then you get to level three, and now we become we have freedom four. And so we now see, oh, I want to be free to make as much difference uh, as I can to my family, to my friends, to the community, to my church, to the kingdom of God, to the society. I want to be free to do something with my gifts and talents mm -hmm. to make a, as pervasive, enduring, and deep uh, you know, as I, uh, difference as I can make. And finally Finally, of course, uh, on, on level four, it's surrender to God. It seems strange at first, you know, that surrendering could cause freedom. But when you realize that mm -hmm. all that God wants, uh, for, you know, for us is he wants to optimize, you know, in our lives. He wants to optimize salvation and love and goodness for us and through us. So the more we surrender to God and to God's will, the more he's going to optimize salvation, goodness and love for us and and through us. And so, of course, true freedom is to surrender to his will. Now, of course, you look at that and, and, and you know, it matters. So when people come up, I'm pro-choice, I'm pro-freedom, you got to ask, hey, wait a minute. And everybody should ask. Mm -hmm. We should always ask people who say that. Well, what do you mean? Freedom one, freedom two, freedom three, or freedom four? Mm -hmm. Which one are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And they will say, what do you mean by those things? And then you tell them what I just said, or you read the book, T Ten Universal Principles, <laughs> right. and look at this. Right. And then all of a sudden they go, yike, I thought I was contributive, yet it seems like I have a very freedom from view, right? I, I mean, you can see that freedom freedom from view in the in the in the pro life movement so easily and let's take a look at love you know uh, people are always using i want a very loving compassionate response i always say well what do you mean by love do you mean by love mm -hmm. uh, or compassion love 1 love 2 love 3 love 4 compassion 1 2 3 or 4 which one are you talking about they're totally different definitions love on level 1 is just the feeling of mm -hmm. love right? It's pleasure uh, love, right? A love too is feeling admired or being loved by somebody else. Mm -hmm. So long as you admire me, which of course I mistake for your loving me, so long as I, you admire me, I, I think that's love. But you know, the minute you get to level three, you go, oh my gosh, that wasn't love. Mm -hmm. Love is really giving myself away. Love is really trying to make a, an optimal positive difference to my family and my friends and to the world, the community, the church, the kingdom of 
God, culture, etc. And finally, of course, there's the universal sense of, of love as well. I, I, I'm not just going to love individual human beings that come within my purview. I, I want to love, you know, the, the kingdom, the world, the culture, right? I, I want to love these mm -hmm. huge groups of people in the same way that God loves creation. I want to give myself to as many people as I can for the sake of their salvation, their eternal salvation, as I can. That's a very different notion of love. So you have to ask mm -hmm. people, well, do you mean compassion one, two, three, or four? And that's what I was talking about in the previous example. You know, I mean, one person can say, well, I'm just being compassionate. Mm -hmm. uh, but that notice that that view of compassion is the old cop-out feeling compassion, which is compassion number one or compassion two. But whereas if you're really saying to that person, gosh, I'm concerned about your salvation. I'm concerned about this, uh, the consequences that another person might feel, etc. Now you've moved to compassion three and four. Mm -hmm. But you, you've got to ask people, do you mean love one, two, three, or four? It's the same with ethics and virtue. Mm -hmm. You know, People are always saying, that's not fair. Well, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Do you mean fair one, fair, uh, you know, justice one, fairness and justice, right, or roughly equivalent? Do you mean fairness one, justice one, fairness two, fairness three, or fairness four? And you can see the differences, you know, in your view of fairness, depending on what level of happiness and meaning of life you are living for. And the same thing holds true with the common good. The same thing holds true with suffering. The same thing holds true, you know, with even personhood. You know, all these terms differ mm -hmm. depending on how, what level of happiness you're living for. But I think we can, as good pro-life ad advocates, the moment these kinds of discourse, and people bring these, these words out legitimately, they really feel like they're telling you their truth. And, and, and what we can do without insulting them mm -hmm. is we can say, hey, uh, what do you mean by love over there when you say that? What do you mean by quality of life when you say, is, is quality of life uh, and, and success, is that really, um, you know, just having the greatest amount of pleasure impulses per second? That'd be level one. Or do you mean by quality of life and success that you've got all the opportunities you could possibly have with all of the power and status that you could possibly have? Is that a good quality of life or rather is that would be a level two quality of life or rather is quality of life really something uh, that where you can make the most possible difference to you know positive difference to your family and friends and community and church mm -hmm. and kingdom of God and you can even look for their salvation as well as their worldly good you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and of course level right. four quality of life would be the, you know looking for that salvation right. and, and so my point that I'm trying to get to in, in all of this is we can just simply ask the question I'm glad you're pro-choice and pro-freedom would you mind telling me what you mean by freedom and choice right. do you mean freedom one two three or four mm -hmm. I'm glad that that you, you want to have a loving and compassionate response are you talking about love one two three or four compassion one two three or four I'm glad you're worried about justice and fairness are you talking about fairness one two three or four I'm glad you're really in your 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 in, you know, concerned about quality of life. Do you mean quality of life one, two, three, or four? I'm glad you're concerned for the common good. Do you mean common good one, two, three, or four? And if you just go to the last mm -hmm. part of that book, Ten Universal Principles, right. I've got those things all kind of, uh, you know, graded out for you. Right. But I think if you just help people to clarify what they're talking about, they go gulp. I guess I kind of have level two views of freedom and ethics and love and suffering and personhood and common good and quality of life. But I thought I was a level three kind of guy. Right. Or I thought I was a level four kind of guy. Right. You know, and of course I would say, hey, if you're really level four, if you really think you have faith, you're going to church, you're claiming to be a religious, faith-filled kind of a guy, then you ought to have a level four view of quality of life. You ought to have a level four view of love and a level four view of freedom and a level four view of ethics and virtue or fairness and a level four view of, of suffering and a level four view of the common good. And if you did, you couldn't possibly be in favor of killing an innocent child for the simple reason that the mother just doesn't want to have that child right. anymore.
as if that child had no intrinsic dignity apart from your mother. You can't hold that either in level three or level four. It's impossible. And so, of course, it's just getting clarification right. on these terms. And frankly, I think, you know, all those terms have been co-opted by the culture, have just been co-opted by the culture, and they've been so co-opted, frankly, that um, uh, today we actually believe that the real definition of freedom is freedom to, love to, ethics to, etc. We, we completely have been co-opted, mm -hmm. and we've got to get back to our Christian roots. And that's why I pointed out there, don't don't get into a right. social political discourse with anyone until you figure right. out what level they're using those terms. It's on interesting those, too. What we call categories of right. discourse. It's interesting too. In thinking about what you were saying, uh, uh, you know, reflecting on it, it, just the idea that in some ways, before the child's born, it's all about what the woman wants. After the child's born, many times it turns out it's more important what society wants for the child than what the mother wants for the child. Suddenly, it kind of flips. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, there's a lot of sophistry going on out there. And uh, what I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, uh, right now, I think we are so level two oriented mm -hmm. and we've been so co-opted into a level two definition of all these terms of ca categories of cultural discourse. I frankly believe that the culture is in a dogmatic slumber, mm -hmm. you know, and we can call the culture out of the dogmatic slumber by making these distinctions about these uh, categories and forcing people to choose what kind of freedom, love, ethics, etc. they're talking about. And if they do that, then I think they're going to find themselves either as de facto level mm -hmm. two individuals or if they really are aspiring level three and four individuals, they'll have to bring up their view of freedom and love and ethics, et cetera, to correspond uh, to where they want to be in their own lives and their happiness. Okay, very good. You know, we're gonna end up kind of wrapping up the book uh, next week and talking a little bit more and kind of co consolidating it all, but we, we kind of gave mm -hmm. a teaser at the beginning about the idea that maybe you'd be talking about something that would be coming in the future weeks that uh, is a little bit different than we've done before and why don't you want to talk about it a little bit uh, father yeah we're going to be talking about a an encyclopedic website uh, called CredibleCatholic.com. right let me repeat that one more time because it's up and available it's not complete uh, we're in the process of bringing more uh, of the content to it the content is written it's now being checked it's being loaded up onto the website but it's called CredibleCatholic.com. Mm -hmm. and if you want to uh, in, in a couple weeks from now starting in May we're going to go ahead and and start uh, going through this chapter by chapter mm -hmm. there's it's a 20 volume encyclopedia and you all know how the Catechism of the Catholic Catholic Church tells us the what of our faith. What does the church teach? Mm -hmm. But of course, there are these two other nagging questions that keep uh, haranguing us. Now, sometimes the catechism tells us some things, sometimes not. First of all, why does the church teach this? And what is the evidence for what the church is teaching? Mm -hmm. Is there empirical, rational, reasonable evidence for what the church is teaching? Even for the doctrine of God, the existence mm -hmm. of God, the existence of an immortal soul, the, Jesus, the reality of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, even, you know, Mary, the Marian doctrines. What kinds of evidence do we have? Why does the church teach about the Trinity? Recall, you know, mm -hmm. that we were going just a couple weeks ago through what the Trinity is, etc., and what a person is, and, and what the Godhead is. Well, it's the same thing. All mm -hmm. these whys and the evidence are really important, but there's also another big question and it's called the how. We need practical advice about how to engage in our spiritual conversion, how to get more uh, deeply into prayer, mm -hmm. how to engage more deeply in our moral conversion, and, and how do we understand the church's good teaching uh, about morality, etc. Mm -hmm. And that's what the 20 volumes IncredibleCatholic.com is supposed to do. All of those volumes are free of charge. 
so you'll be able to go right. there. But there's one thing I just want to point out. I know we're probably going to have to wind it up, but there's a, on there, when you go to CredibleCatholic.com, you're going to see a red button right in the middle of that landing page. And it says, for the seven essential modules, click here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start in May by talking about those seven essential modules. And the reason is, is those seven modules, which are vi voiceover PowerPoints with embedded videos, have been prepared for confirmation and catechesis classes, but for individual home use as well. Mm -hmm. And this gives enough evidence to a, a young person who is about to encounter, you know, the dichotomy with right. science, you know, and will need some scientific evidence for God and the soul, etc. This is enough evidence to give to a young person about why right. believe the Catholic Church. Why would the Catholic Church be truly right. what and Jesus intended? Really, and uh, what's really exciting yeah. is in a format that, that so many young people find that much more accessible. And with that being yeah. said, that's this is just a teaser, Father. We don't have to explain everything. Yeah. We're, <laughs> right, we, we just want to whet their appetite, okay? <laughs> so let's have a blessing and, and uh, we'll see you next week week. <laughs> and bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord, with his Holy Spirit, send that spirit down upon you to inspire you and to guide you and to protect you. May the Lord of all wisdom help you to recognize the wisdom of this faith that we have been given, this transcendent knowledge of freedom and love and ethics and suffering and all the other dis uh, categories of cultural discourse so that you might be able to expound with great wisdom the philosophy and above all the wisdom of God to a society and culture in deep need in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Spitzer. We shall see you next week. God bless. The, the one and only Father Spitzer. It's his universe. We're here. And, of course, something to look forward to next week, 10 Universal Principles, the conclusion. And uh, it's exciting. As you can see, we'll be exploring new aspects and new planets in Father Spitzer's universe. But you can meet us as we begin the journey at the intersection of faith and reason anytime. And we'll look for you before we leave. Thanks. <laughs>